and I guess I should say that this is caused primarily in, or in most cases by the development of a benign tumor in one, one of your parathyroid glands. That's typically what causes this, although not always. But the consequences of this over time are, you know, if you listen to what parathyroid hormone does, if you're over secreting parathyroid hormone, you are constantly telling your skeleton to dissolve itself, essentially. And so accelerated bone loss, osteopenia, osteoporosis is a consequence of untreated parathyroid disease. In addition to that, hypercalcemia, long-term hypercalcemia leads to increased risk for stroke, you know, cerebrovascular disease, Disease, coronary artery disease and heart attack. Your risk for renal failure, kidney damage goes up and life expectancy has been shown to go down. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button, you punch that and it's gonna notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. That's gonna walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore the link between your parathyroid glands, hyperparathyroidism, bone loss, and osteoporosis is Dr. Jamie Mitchell. Dr. Jamie Mitchell was a senior endocrine surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio when he left to join Norman Parathyroid Center in Tampa in 2014. Dr. Mitchell went to the College of the Holy Cross for his undergraduate degree, and then Georgetown University School of Medicine for his medical degree. He completed general surgery training at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, a medical center of Harvard Medical School. He then underwent specialty training in endocrine surgery, including thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. During his training, he won multiple awards for his research. He stayed on faculty at Cleveland Clinic for seven years as a senior thyroid parathyroid surgeon until early 2014 when he moved to Tampa. Dr. Norman says he is one of the best technical surgeons he has ever seen. Dr. Mitchell has, a, has published over 30 scientific publications and is a frequent speaker at national meetings on advanced ultrasound techniques for neck tumors, and he also has two children. Dr. Jamie Mitchell, welcome to the show. Hi, hey, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. And I know this is an important topic for our audience that they may or may not have heard of parathyroid glands. There's a good chance they haven't heard of them. And this could be a contributor to their bone loss. So this is a really important topic. And you are absolutely the person that is best suited to talk about this topic. So that's why I'm glad that you're here. Maybe you could just share, I know I walked through a little bio of you before, but maybe you could share a little bit more about your experience, your expertise, your background, and then how you got into this field. I grew up in a pretty small town in Maine. And uh I was kind of always a science uh, a science nerd back then. Uh, I mean, I had friends. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea, but you know, I liked science, et cetera. I kind of knew I was going to do something in that vein when I, you know, when I got older. And then uh, when I was pr relatively young, I got uh, fairly seriously sick a couple of times, and that experience in the hospital with, you know, with the doctors. Uh, is what got me sort of interested in leaning towards uh, uh, medicine um, in that science vein. So I uh, went to undergrad and was a biology and a pre-med major. Uh, was really happy to get into Georgetown uh, Medical School, um, four great years in D.C. And, uh, you know, as you do your clinical rotations, one of the first ones I did was in surgery. And, uh, you know, everybody likes surgery when they rotate through it. It's it's pretty cool. It's not the kind of thing you see every day. Um, and it, it's kind of exciting for everybody when they first see it. Uh, most people don't want to do it because the training is sort of so long and, and difficult, but uh, I, I was hooked <laughs> first, uh, you know, after that first rotation, I knew that's what I was going to do. And so, you know, did, uh, as you said, uh, general surgery residency um, in Boston, I was there for seven years. Uh, five years of, of training and I did two years in the lab uh, where I did uh, you know basic science and clinical research and that's when I got interested in endocrine surgery uh, not a popular uh, specialty uh, at, uh, at my program uh, at the time I don't think anyone had ever gone into it um, from Beth Visual uh, at, at that point um, but I did a lot of clinical projects with a, one of the surgeons who did quite a bit of endocrine surgery and um, that's what got me interested in it and so uh, I did a you know fellowship training in endocrine surgery at the Cleveland Clinic, as you said, 
um, and stayed on their staff, you know, as an academic surgeon, um, teaching residents and fellows and, and doing that whole thing. And it's a pretty specialized field to begin with. Uh, you know, as you said, it's, it's really focuses on thyroid surgery, parathyroid surgery and adrenal surgery. And then after, you know, I was there for about eight years and, um, was put in touch with Jim Norman of the Norman Parathyroid Center. Anyone who does parathyroid surgery around the country knows the name, knows Jim Norman. I knew the name. Uh, patients often asked about him and his group and how they do it, et cetera. So, you know, I knew about him, but didn't know much about his practice. And so a former fellow of mine put us in touch and I was certainly curious and came down to Tampa to sort of check him and this practice out. And the rest is history. You know, I, I, I came down to Tampa in 20, uh, it was 2015 actually. And uh, it's hard to say no to being part of something that's the best in the world at something. And so, um, so joined him. I was a bit humbling at first. I thought I was pretty good at parathyroid surgery when I joined, but uh, what I've learned since being in the practice is, you know, it's, uh, it's monumental. So um, it's just a different way of treating the disease. So been here for, you know, for, since then, um, Two years ago, we moved into our own hospital. It's called the Hospital for Endocrine Surgery. Uh, really uh, grateful to be there. It's it's a it's the only hospital in the world dedicated entirely to the treatment of endocrine surgical patients. We got to design this hospital ourselves, which is really incredible. I mean, surgeons don't typically get to do you know get to do that. Typically, you you know you get privileges at a hospital as a surgeon, and you you make do with what you what they got. You have to compete with other service lines and blah, blah, blah. Um, this place, we got to design every inch of it for ourselves, for our patients. Uh, and that's all that's taken care of there. So it's uh, it's a really great place. And uh, I feel really fortunate to be there. That's amazing. Now, we'll talk about the exact location, the hospital, uh, and, and all that stuff. We're going to talk about that at the end. Because if somebody determines you know, from listening to this or after this that they need additional help, we're going to make sure we point them to that location and where it's at. So before we do that, maybe you could just walk through, let's start with some of the basics. What are parathyroid glands? Uh, most people probably never heard of them, but maybe you could walk through what they are, where they're located, what their role is, and maybe a little bit of the history behind them. It's a, as you say, almost nobody has ever heard of these glands. You know, everybody's heard about the thyroid gland and the thyroid is the root cause of all their problems, et cetera. So the thyroid is in, in people's consciousness, but no one, not nobody, but very few people have heard of the parathyroid glands. It's a lot of confusion. When they first hear about them, they think it's the thyroid. They, they think they're related, et cetera. Um, and they're not. Uh, everybody has four uh, parathyroid glands. Uh, they're quite small, um, you know, the size of a a pea the size of a lentil. Um, these are these are uh, <laughs> are things that people are familiar with that are used to describe their size, but they're quite small. Um, they're located near the thyroid in most cases, uh, in the same part of the neck that your thyroid lives, uh, and that's how they got their name. You know, the history of how they were discovered uh, is is interesting. Um, back in the early days of surgery, uh, if you had a thyroidectomy, you actually had about a fifty percent chance of dying after that operation which, you know, is shocking to think about. But the reason is that no one knew that parathyroid glands existed. And so um, because they're so small, and even though there had been such detailed anatomic, you know, dissection studies of the human body, they've never been discovered. So people would get their thyroids removed and all of the parathyroid glands would be removed as well by accident. And back then, you know, the, the, and as I'll get into, they they regulate your calcium homeostasis. And so these patients would, would have profound hypocalcemia after this operation with all of these glands removed. And we take it for granted now, but you couldn't measure calcium levels in the blood. Those assays didn't exist at that time. So these patients had all sorts of problems and they, they would die of arrhythmias from hypocalcemia. Some years ago, I think it was in the, in the late 1700s, a Swedish medical student actually was doing an anatomic dissection on a rhinoceros of all things. And that large of an animal is what was required to realize that parathyroid glands were actually a structure that was identifiable. So that's how they were identified. They were, they were near the thyroid. And so they were called, you know, very creatively. Scientists aren't super creative. They were called parathyroid glands. It was actually many, many years after that discovery before anyone had any idea what, what they did. Uh, but that's how they're discovered. A little bit of the history of them. Um, and all they do, there's four of them. They all do the same thing. They regulate your calcium levels. And essentially how it works is 
calcium is regulated, obviously, like everything quite um, tightly, you know, in our bloodstream, and it'll fluctuate within a certain range, and that's fine. But if it drops below a certain concentration in your bloodstream, parathyroid glands have uh, the cells in those glands have receptors that can sense that concentration. And when it drops below a certain set point, they will release or secrete parathyroid hormone in response. And parathyroid hormone has one job is to raise your calcium levels back up to normal. And it does it three, three main ways. Number one, and this is important for this uh, podcast audience, is that yeah, it activates cells, and you probably know about these cells. They're cells that sit in your skeleton called osteoclasts, and they're usually dormant, but parathyroid hormone activates those cells, and osteoclasts just dissolve bone mineral uh, and release those minerals, including calcium, into your bloodstream. So that's one thing that those glands do to start raising your calcium levels back up to normal. It also acts in your kidneys to uh, prevent the collecting tubules from secreting as much calcium in the urine, so you hold on to more calcium in your bloodstream. Uh, and finally, uh, parathyroid hormone activates vitamin D from the 25 to the 125 dihydroxy form that allows you to absorb more calcium from your GI tract into the bloodstream. So that's what the hormone does. Those things are kicked into gear. Your calcium levels come back up to normal. Body's happy and parathyroid hormone secretion stops. That's how they work. Crash course in parathyroid uh, history there and physiology. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. It's not complicated physiology, but very, very important. Calcium is in, uh, important for many things in the body. Um, things that are important uh, like muscle contraction, nerve conduction, secretion of protons or acid in the stomach, et cetera. So um, keeping the you know calcium regulated tight, of course, is important. And as we'll talk about, I think, a little, in a little bit, um, when those things are out of whack, it causes a lot of problems. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to take one more minute to talk about if you are somebody who was newly diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, and you're at a point where you're stressed, you're worried, you're overwhelmed, you have no idea where to start or how to get started getting confident in your plan, I want to tell you about the Stronger Bone Solution Program. Over 5,000 people have come through this Stronger Bone Solution Program, and it walks you through the exact process you need to fill in the missing pieces, uncover critical things in your plan that you may not be aware of, and help you make modifications, adjustments, and tweaks to get you to the place where you're building stronger bones. I want you to get confident in your plan so that you can focus on living life and enjoying the life that you deserve with the people you love most. So if that's where you wanna be, head over to bonecoach.com forward slash apply and apply for our Stronger Bone Solution program right now. I'm Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to see you inside this program. I want to help you get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. Hope to see you inside very soon. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah, so let's talk about that. What what happens when we have uh, hyperparathyroidism, right? Where we do have uh, a, this actual either primary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Can you walk through each of those and what those look like and how somebody's going to know if they're being affected by that? Uh, sure. Um, I'll start with primary hyperparathyroidism, which is which is uh, primarily what I, um, as a surgeon, deal with. Um, primary hyperparathyroidism uh, occurs when one or more parathyroid glands becomes hyperfunctioning. So uh, instead of secreting parathyroid hormone when your body needs it, when your calcium is low, uh, it uh, the gland secretes parathyroid hormone all the time or or sporadically in excess, and. Uh, instead of uh, a low calcium level being returned to normal, normal calcium levels then become elevated. And so, you know, so who cares? Who cares if your calcium is a little bit high? Uh, isn't that good? Isn't that good for your, I hear this all the time. Isn't that great? I, I, mean, I saw my calcium was high in my labs. I thought that was good for my bones. Well, no, it, it isn't good for you. Uh, there's consequences to hypercalcemia over time. Number one, uh, and, and I guess I should say that this is caused primarily in, or in most cases by the development of a benign tumor in one, one of your parathyroid glands. That's typically what causes this, although not always. But the consequences of this over time are, um, if, you know, if you listen to what parathyroid hormone does um, and, and relevant to this podcast, um, if you're, if you're over-secreting parathyroid hormone, you are constantly telling your skeleton to dissolve itself, essentially. And so, you know, um, accelerated bone loss, osteopenia, osteoporosis is a consequence of untreated parathyroid disease. 
Uh, in addition to that, hypercalcemia, uh, long-term hypercalcemia leads to increased risk for stroke, you know, cerebrovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and heart attack. Um, your risk for renal failure, uh, kidney damage goes up. And uh, life expectancy has been shown to go down. So this is, this is, you know, this doesn't happen overnight, but over, you know, untreated parathyroid disease over time leads to these end organ complications and potentially less years of your life. Uh, so that's, pri that's primary hyperparathyroidism. You, you asked about um, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, most forms of secondary hyperparathyroidism are not surgical diseases. Um, they're more, they're more medical diseases. And the reason for that is uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism means you are making extra or more parathyroid hormone than is usual, but it's you don't have disease parathyroid glands per se. Uh, the extra parathyroid hormone secretion is in response to, you know, a condition of your body. Um, for example, common reasons for this are um, low or end stage renal disease. Uh, for example, patients on dialysis all develop a form of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, Severe vitamin D deficiency can cause elevated or, or you know, hyper secretion of parathyroid hormone, again, trying to compensate for that. Uh, malabsorption problems like um, celiac disease or uh, one of the common ones we see now are patients who have had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery for obesity. Uh, the anatomy that results from that operation bypasses the part of your intestine that is primarily responsible for absorbing calcium and vitamin D. So these patients tend to have low calcium and vitamin D levels. Their parathyroid, uh, parathyroid glands secrete extra hormone in response to that to try to compensate for it. Um, these things are, are, are traditionally managed medically rather than surgically. The one exception is extreme cases of renal failure related secondary disease that is refractory to medical treatment. Uh, those patients um, are referred for surgery. For primary hyperparathyroidism, is there a specific demographic or age range or you know something like that of people that are typically affected by primary hyperparathyroidism? Sure. Um, the the peak incidence of, of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is in women. It's three to one more common in women than men, and uh, the peak incidence is sixty years of age and above. Although. Uh, you really can, uh, you can see it, uh, of course, you can see it in men, it's just not as common, and you can see it even in kids. Um, I actually did a consult today on a, on a 10-year-old boy who has classic hyperparathyroid. That's the youngest I've ever seen, but you see it in teenagers occasionally. Um, each decade that you get older, it's, it's more common, but peak incidence is women uh, 60 and above. And how are you typically diagnosing this condition? Typically, or I should say the most common way that this gets picked up by uh, by doctors is routine blood work. And, you know, they notice, hopefully, um, that a patient, you know, then their, their routine chemistry chemistries at their annual physical, they have high calcium level. And, you know, the, the, the next follow-up should be to repeat that with a parathyroid hormone level. Although I'll, I'll say that a lot of times, that, you know, that doesn't happen. Uh, the disease can cause a lot of symptoms, um, they're non-specific, though. Uh, it's not like having a heart attack where you know you present with crushing substernal chest pain radiating down your left arm. You know something's wrong. You know you get you get help. You go seek out care. The symptoms of hyperparathyroidism, while common, I mean most patient, patients have symptoms, but they're they're sort of insidious and they're non-specific. Although they can affect quality of life pretty pretty significantly. These include chronic fatigue, neurocognitive deficits like trouble with short-term memory and trouble with concentration bone and joint pain, uh, very common, GI symptoms like abdominal pain or vague dyspepsia, et cetera, uh, mood problems, anxiety, depression, malaise, irritability, um, these are common, muscle weakness, um, polyuria, patients, you know, hypercalcemia acts like an osmotic diuretic, so people with hypercalcemia pee all the time, they're often getting up multiple times at night, their sleep is impacted, et cetera. They drink a lot because they think they think they're peeing a lot because they're drinking a lot, but they're actually drinking a lot to catch up to the dehydration that there is happening to them from the diuresis. Constipation is common. The, the hypercalcemia interferes with muscle contraction, including the smooth muscle of the gut. And so constipation is another common sort of GI symptom. So patients have a lot of symptoms, but they're not usually like sudden or bad enough 
that they seek out care for it. So um, it's a very underdiagnosed and sort of undertreated disease uh, in my experience. When we're looking at the specific values for each of these lab tests, so for vitamin D, for serum calcium, for ionized calcium, for parathyroid hormone, where do you like to see these levels at and where, what could be an indicator that it's not where it needs to be and further investigation needs to happen? Well, so calcium, uh, parathyroid hormone levels, uh, vitamin D levels, these, as I talked about and explained how the, you know how the hormone works there, they're all connected and they're they're part of the diagnosis. But the two most com you know the two most important values are the calcium and the PTH value. And uh, for adults above age forty, calcium levels really should be in the nine milligram per deciliter range. Part of the problem with this, and this is uh, this is this is part of the. Um, the underdiagnosis of this is that most assays will give the normal range for calcium into the low 10 range. Uh, many will be eight and a half to 10 and a half, for example, although it varies depending on the assay used. And so a lot of doctors will see 10.4 in their patient and say, okay, everything's fine. This is in the normal range. Calcium levels in the tens like that is, is common and normal when you're young and you're building a building a skeleton as you're growing. You need more calcium available for that, et cetera. But as you get older and that settles down, um, we don't need as much calcium. And so if it's above 10, typically that should be considered elevated. And I've operated now on many, many patients where their calcium levels are between 10 and 10.2 and they have classic hyperparathyroidism. So um, it's something that... Uh, a lot of doctors don't know, to be honest, and um, we do a lot of things on our website to try to empower patients to understand um, when they're looking at their labs or they're being told, hey, your calcium levels look okay. Uh, look look closely because they may not be. So that's calcium. PTH values, I mean, the, the normal range is typically between 15 and 65, although it's really the relationship of that PTH with the calcium levels, you know, because having a mildly elevated PTH value doesn't necessarily mean you have a problem. It really is it's the relationship of those two levels measured together, calcium being the most important. If your calcium is elevated and you have a PTH that's even in the mid to high normal range, that, that means you have hyperparathyroidism. And a lot of doctors miss that. Um, they'll see the high calcium and they'll say, hey, we should check this out. They'll get a PTH value and it'll measure 50, which is within the normal range. But if you're hypercalcemic, and your parathyroid glands are behaving normally or they're not involved or causing the hypercalcemia. As I told you at the beginning of the podcast, um, you only make that hormone when your calcium is low or too low. That's the only reason parathyroid hormone is, is secreted. So if you're hypercalcemic with a calcium of 10.8 or 11 or whatever it is, clearly elevated, and you have a pH that's 50 or 55 or mid to high normal, that is inappropriately normal. And so we used to think that you had to have both be elevated to make this diagnosis, but we learned you know, probably 20 years ago now, uh, people who take care of this a lot, we recognized, hey, you know, you don't have to have an elevated PTH to make the diagnosis. Probably 20% of patients with the disease have PTH values to measure within the normal range. But a lot of doctors don't know that. Are there other cases where it, it may not be abundantly clear up front, but it's still a possibility that this person has hyperparathyroidism? So one of the things I see or mistakes I see made um, is patients will have you know some lab work that that's concerning. Their calcium will be elevated. The doctors will look into it and they'll check uh, they'll check some sets of labs and it'll be abnormal and be concerning. And then they'll repeat it and it looks normal. And they'll just say, oh, it was it wasn't a problem. You don't have this. It's not that uncommon with people with the disease for those labs to fluctuate quite a bit. And so um, it's really an overall pattern of biochemistry biochemistry that's important to look at. And if you have a set of biochemistry that's abnormal, you're, you're a doctor evaluating a patient and you repeat it and it looks okay, you shouldn't just forget about it and say, okay, I was wrong. It, it was a mistake. You should keep following it, you know, periodically and look for an overall pattern because many patients with this disease, they'll fluctuate. They'll look clearly abnormal. They'll look normal a week later. They'll look clearly abnormal. And those patients usually have disease. So it's important to keep your eye on those, on those levels. I'm not saying you have to, you know, rush to the operating room, but um, don't just forget about the potential of, of a patient having this problem just because of one follow-up set of lab data looks looks you know looks better or looks okay. It doesn't usually work that way. And because of the size and location of the parathyroid glands, 
is it you're not able to just look at the average person and tell them like, okay, I can see in your throat, you know, that you have parathyroid uh, an issue with your parathyroids, right? No, uh, you, you can't see these. You can't palpate them. You can't feel them. You know, patients will often say, yeah, you know, I think it's here. I can feel something over here. And I said, you have a 50 50 chance of being right but you, you know whatever you're feeling is not your it's not your parathyroid glands uh, even when you have a parathyroid tumor they you, they just don't cause local local symptoms like that you cannot feel them um and even so, imaging studies there are imaging studies that people traditionally use in preparation for surgery and, and uh, i'll talk about that in a little bit but imaging technology to to image or to see abnormal parathyroid glands just isn't very good even in 2023 the sensitivity for all of the tests that are used are, is maybe 50 or, you know, maybe 60%. So half the people that I operate on have imaging tests that show absolutely nothing. And, you know, because of that, um, so the sensitivity isn't very good. The specificity of these imaging tests isn't very good either because signals will show up on these imaging tests that have nothing to do with parathyroid glands. So th th there are a lot of false positives as well. And so they're, they're not useful for diagnosis. The only thing that makes the diagnosis of this disease is the biochemistry. And patients have a hard time with that. They, you know, when they come to surgery and I'll go over the process, I think maybe later, but um, we always do one of these imaging tests before, before surgery. And they always want to know, did it, you know, what did it show? It's the first thing they ask me, what did, what did it show? Because patients don't like to go to the operating room for something that I haven't laid eyes on. You know, they're uncomfortable with it and I totally get it. Um, but I know that a patient has a parathyroid tumor, whether I can see it or not before the operation, because they're neuroendocrine tumors that change the patient's biochemistry in a very specific way. So their labs tell me that they have it or that they don't. The imaging tests are a tool that we use, but they're definitely not diagnostic. And as you say, I can't just look at somebody and say, you know, tell if they have this or not. It's all based on the biochemistry. So let's talk about the scans, right? So, okay, so somebody gets their lab tests back, and we suspect that they have primary hyperparathyroidism, what's the next step? Is the next step the scan? And then to, to see potentially if, you know, if something is there, but either way, it sounds like an exploratory surgery may be warranted at that point, right? Imaging tests are common, as I said, and uh, a lot of it depends on the approach to surgery. Um, most surgeons in this country do what's called a focal parathyroid operation. They get imaging tests and do their operation based on the results of what that test shows. Why, why is it done that way? Uh, to be honest, it's it's easier. You know, it, it uh, it's easier to to use an imaging test to sort of tell you what to do for the operation. This is opposed to doing a four gland operation where you evaluate all four glands during surgery, which is what traditionally used to be done back when parathyroid surgery started years ago. And it's what I do. And it's what the surgeons in my practice do. The reason we that we do what we do is that, use, as I told you, imaging tests are, are pretty bad um, and they can be really misleading. They can show signals that have nothing to do with parathyroid glands. And I, I do a lot of reoperative parathyroid cases where people have had surgery elsewhere that's been unsuccessful. And then they end up at our center, you know, looking for help and trying to get to, trying to get fixed. And often it's because the surgeon used an imaging test to tell them what to do in the operation. And, you know, they were told the wrong thing to do essentially. So imaging tests are a tool. The most common uh, imaging test, one is called a SESTA MEB scan. Uh, everyone has a hard time pronouncing that, but it, it's a nuclear medicine X-ray. And how it works is a patient is given uh, an injection of, of a radiopharmaceutical, a chemical, which is really two chemicals that are complex together in the lab. One is a delivery system that's called Sestamibi. This is just a chemical that is taken up by certain types of cells, parathyroid cells, hopefully. The thyroid takes it up, salivary gland tissue takes it up, the liver, the heart. So a number of tissues take up this tracer, but that's the delivery system. Technetium is... Um, the radioisotope that allows us to, to image that, that on a gamma camera and to take a picture of it, so to speak. So the hope is that it'll accumulate in parath the, parath the overactive parathyroid cells of the tumor. The gamma camera will then see that focus of uptake, and then that tells you, hey, this is where the problem is. So a lot of surgeons use that to tell them, oh, I'm going to go take that out, and that's, that's the problem. But again, a lot of times that's very misleading, and the wrong thing is done. So that's one of the common tests that are done. Ultrasound of the neck is another common one. Uh, they all have their strengths and limitations. And we do Cessna AV scans before every operation. And I do an ultrasound of everybody's neck. 
But as I said before, probably half the time those imaging tests don't show me the parathyroid tumor. Um, being successful with parathyroid surgery is an, it really just comes down to an understanding of the embryology and the anatomy of these glands. And that's what makes the surgery complicated or technically difficult because the things you're looking for are small, as I said. And unlike a lot of other organs in your body, parathyroids are not always in the same place. Um, the heart is, the, you know, you know where the heart's going to be. That's not the challenge of the operation. Um, but parathyroids can be variable in their location within the neck or sometimes outside the neck. Parathyroid glands during embryology begin in what becomes, you know, your head, and they descend from the head down into the neck. And there can be, you know, a lot, there's a lot of migrations happening during embryology, and they don't always go perfectly. Um, it's actually a miracle that we come out, you know, formed as human beings uh, func and a functional human beings at that. But parathyroid migrations can sometimes go awry. And so uh, they can be in variable spots in the neck. They can sometimes not descend and be way up under the jaw. They can be in the chest. They keep descending further than they're supposed to, and they can be in other ectopic locations. So understanding the anatomy and this embryology is really important to being successful. That, uh, more important than letting an imaging test tell you this is where your problem is, if that makes sense. That, that absolutely does. So can you walk through, I've got a few other speci very specific questions, but before I get to those, I want to walk through, can you walk us through what surgery looks like or what the treatment actually looks like from, okay, I'm a patient, we're going to go do this surgery, we're going to take care of this benign adenoma, hopefully, right? Uh, what does the process look like? Sure. So, so the, I guess the, the first important point is, uh, are there any other treatments besides surgery? And the answer is no, uh, there's no medical treatment um, for hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the only way to treat it is to figure out which which of the glands has the tumor in it, uh, gland or glands as the case may be, and to remove it. So awesome. surgery is the only, the only effective treatment for this. On that note, I do have a question because people may be thinking, right, if this is a, a tumor, right, it can nutritional and supplemental interventions coupled with fasting help to reduce or shrink the size of this? Uh, it's never been shown. Um, I, I've had, uh, you know, not that many, but a number of patients over the course of my career, I've been doing this a long time at this point, who have, who have tried various, uh, you know, I can't remember the exact details, but they've, they've tried uh, holistic or other types of uh, therapies, uh, sometimes for some years and, um, and ended up coming to surgery because they, they, they don't work. I, I don't know of any, and I, you know, and I don't, uh, I don't have a closed mind to that sort of thing, frankly. But I've never seen any data or any evidence that nutritional um, alterations or you know diet or any other environmental changes uh, can change this. Um, I think it's not yet, not yet anyway. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to hear that too, right? That. I know in other forms of, you know, cancer and when people have tumors in other areas that may be able to, you know, be an option, but for this specific situation, uh, you haven't at least seen that that's been an effective tool. Never seen it. I haven't seen any uh, studies that have shown it. Um, not yet. Um, as I said, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I hope that that's, you know, someone figures it out or not. I mean, it, it would impact my career, obviously, but not, not that I've seen uh, yet. There hasn't been any data shown. You know, the guidelines for parathyroids came out a, a few years ago. They, they update them usually every five years or so. And you know, certainly there was nothing about uh, environmental or nutritional uh, therapies for controlling the disease. Sure. And the reason I'm, I'm asking that is because, you know, our audience has osteoporosis. Most of them have osteoporosis. They've already had a good amount of bone loss that's taken place. And time is important. It's an important consideration, right? So if you are going down the path of, you know, okay, I have primary hyperparathyroidism, but I'm going to try to do this with nutrition and fasting and stuff like that. This is, this is why I brought this up is time is probably not going to be in your favor in that situation. And are you willing to risk more bone loss to test something that is probably going to end in a surgery anyway, right? So that, that's why I brought that up a good point. Um, those things are probably important. You know, bone loss, I, you know, in most of the patients that I operate on, many have bone loss of varying degrees, some quite severe, some mild, et cetera. And it's usually multifactorial. I mean, I don't usually tell them or think that uh, every ounce of their, of their, uh, their low T scores is entirely related to hyperparathyroidism, but this is a, you know, it's a, a quickly modifiable reason for it. That's certainly contributing to it. And 
uh, you know, in most patients, T scores improve. You know, the DEXA scan results improve sometimes up to 10% or more in patients who have successful parathyroid surgery. And that's variable as well. You know, not everybody shows the same improvement because, again, there's genetic components and it's multifactorial. But what does happen in everybody really instantaneously is accelerated bone loss that's happening to the patient 10 minutes before we operate on them. That stops instantly. And it does reverse, you know, it reverses and the skeleton starts to, that's one of the reasons that patients are hypocalcemic for a couple of weeks after surgery, because their skeleton that's been losing density for years, usually before they get treated, it, it's, it's, it's like, Hey, I want some of that back. It starts to siphon calcium back out of the bloodstream back into itself. And so blood levels of calcium lower for a period of time, usually a couple, couple, two or three weeks after surgery that we treat with supplements, but um, I think the other stuff is important and, uh, you know, that's where, where you, people like you come in to educate people about the other things that you can do to modify your lifestyle, et cetera, for Mac to maximize bone health. So let's talk about, now let's go into the, uh, the surgery part of this and what that whole experience looks like. And, you know, what the, what is the patient experience? I think one of the reasons that doctors are hesitant or to, to refer for treatment or that, you know, I hear this all the time from patients that the diagnosis is made and their doctor tells them, well, let's just keep an eye on this for a few years, sometimes 10 years or more, I see this. And I think it's because um, a lot of doctors have had less than great experiences with parathyroid surgery outcomes. You know, I think a lot of surgeons in this country do it the wrong way. They, they, they use imaging, as I said, they use imaging tests to tell them what to do. And it's going to lead to the wrong operation a lot of the time. And so I think there's some hesitancy or that people think, you know, nobody wants surgery, but they think it's this terrible thing. But this is the reality of, of parathyroid surgery or what the reality can be. Um, patients uh, who have surgery with us, it's an outpatient procedure. They're, so they're diagnosed, we do a consultation and they're, they're booked for an operation. So they, they come to our hospital, uh, we do the system EB scan that I was mentioning before. It takes about 25 minutes to do. Um, we talk about the results, et cetera. I do an ultrasound of their neck, which takes no time at all, 30 seconds or so. That's to look at the thyroid to make sure there's no thyroid pathology that we need to deal with. And sometimes parathyroid tumors can be inside the thyroid. So the ultrasound is important for figuring some of those things out. The operation that we do uh, always involves identifying and evaluating all four of a patient's parathyroid glands. The reason that this is important is uh, even when imaging tests are clearly positive and you can, let's say, see a left upper parathyroid adenoma in a patient, there's a 30% chance that there is a second abnormal gland. It's not that unusual. While most of the time, 70% of the time patients have one abnormal gland, 30% is high enough that that's an unacceptable failure, you know, failure rate if you uh, do a focal operation. So uh, the operation we do is to identify and evaluate all four glands, as I said. Uh, the operation is done through a, a small incision in the middle of the neck, usually down low. It's two centimeters in size. Through that, we can identify all four glands, two on the left, two on the right. If it's abnormal, then it's it's removed. We can tell if it's abnormal by a visual inspect inspection. Parathyroid tumors are very different looking and obviously different from normal glands, but we also do a functional evaluation of the parathyroids as well. This is based on how much radioactivity they've absorbed from the, from the scan. Whether they're imageable or not on the imaging test, they still have taken up some of that radiopharmaceutical and we can measure that. Uh, and we know what normal tissue should measure versus over, you know, hypermetabolic tissue. And so for tumors, it's not really a game changer, but for glands that are borderline or we're not sure they even look pretty normal, but they measure functionally much higher than they should, then we know that that's abnormal and needs to come out. So that's, uh, so th those are the two evaluations that are done. Uh, an operation usually takes between 15 and 30 minutes to do. So it's relatively quick. Uh, recovery time in the hospital usually takes about an hour and a half. Uh, recovery is not nothing for patients, but it's not in general a difficult recovery. Patients tend to have a sore throat to some degree, usually mild for a couple of days. But in general, patients are up and around doing normal activities the same day as surgery. There's no new medication they need or uh, long-term medication, no prescriptions, but they do need to take calcium supplements for a few weeks after surgery. If patients have bone loss, then we talk about longer term supplementation, et cetera, based on what their you know, DEXA numbers are pre-op. Um, Follow-up is with their doctor, typically in one to two months. There are no sutures that need to be removed or anything of that nature. So the post-op care routine, et cetera, is pretty straightforward. 
And uh, I would say half the volume in our at our hospital is uh, patients from Florida, from the area, but the other half are from patients from uh, all across the country and sometimes uh, outside of the country. I think on Tuesday this week, I operated on a patient who came from Uruguay, and you get to meet people from all over the place. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. If you're finding it helpful, please leave a positive rating and review. Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast or the channel. That lets us help more people and reach and serve more people. And it also lets us know that this is helpful to you on your journey to better health and stronger bones. And then also, right down in the show notes, you can actually find a link to my free bone healthy recipes guide that's going to give you access to some amazing and delicious recipes to support your journey to stronger bones and then also we have a link to my free stronger bones masterclass in the show notes too and that is the three-step process that has helped people in over 1500 cities around the world get confident in their plan for stronger bones over 110,000 people have have taken part in this and it's been really really helpful for them and i want you to have free access to it too so add your name and email right down there in the show notes get access to that free stronger bones masterclass and let's get you confident in your stronger bones plan today you know thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through all of this from helping us understand what the parathyroid glands are about hyperparathyroidism the different types what the the treatment options are what surgery looks like i mean this was really fascinating you know i know i learned a lot in this uh, in this interview also i want to make sure everyone understands you know if this is something that you've gotten your blood work done you're concerned about you want to have a conversation how would they go about doing that with you know you and your team they can go to our website. There's there's a, a link you can click on our website to, uh, to as an, which is an intake form. Um, there's also a form for questions on the website that they can find if they don't if they don't feel like they're quite ready to 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 pull the trigger, so to speak, with a consultation. But they have some questions uh, that they can have them answered that way. Um, form.parathyroid.com is the is the the website or the link to begin an intake process, which is relatively simple and usually within. Uh, a week, um, they'll have a consultation with one of the surgeons, either in person or, or uh, it can be done over the phone, whatever their preference is. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for everything that you do. I know you've got a ton of experience in this area. And if people want to get in touch, do you have, we've got form.parathyroid.com, right? Are there any other websites that we want to make sure we point people to that I'll link to in the show notes as well? Yeah, uh, the main that that's the intake form link. Uh, the main website is just parathyroid.com. There, there really is a wealth of information on that site. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how long it would take to get through it all, but we have videos of the surgery if you want to get a sense for what it's like. There's a there's blogs that talk about all sorts of topics related to this, and just a lot of general information about the diagnosis and the treatment. Some of the things we touched on today, but just you know, expanded, and you can certainly take your time, you know, at your, to, to browse through it all um, and get educated. Fantastic. Well, uh, and then maybe you can reference one more time. What is the name of the new hospital that you have down in Tampa as well? Yeah, it's called the Hospital for Endocrine Surgery. Um, it's not too far from the airport. It's in uh, a neighborhood or section of Tampa called Town and Country. And uh, again, it's it's uh, it's the only hospital of its kind uh, dedicated only to the care of the endocrine surgical patient. And so we have three divisions, the parathyroid surgery division, uh, there's an, a division of adrenal surgery, and there's a thyroid cancer uh, surgery division. So uh, we all operate together. We collaborate quite a bit. Um, it's really a great setup and patients and their families um, typically had a good experience there. People from out of state, we have a number of deals with or partnerships with hotels that are nearby. We have a shuttle service that will pick them up from the airport and take them to the hospital from the hotel, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things in place to uh, to make it uh, as easy as possible for patients when they come. That's fantastic. And did you say the Norman Parathyroid Center is is it now within that hospital for endocrine surgery, or is it still is it separate? Um, it, uh, they're, they're, I mean, the, the offices or the, the centers themselves are separate entities, but we all are part of and operate exclusively operate at this hospital, which is for us. Fantastic. Dr. Jamie Mitchell, thank you so much for taking the time, sharing your wealth, your knowledge. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this episode and for everybody listening, 
You can find all of the resources, show notes, everything mentioned here today over at bonecoach.com forward slash parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, osteoporosis. I want to thank you again so much for your time. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.